So yeah. thank you. Oh, I'm honored to welcome you this afternoon to the Sable Lecture. We thought that we would start by singing a song, Lift Every Voice and Sing. We have included the lyrics to that song in the purple sheet that's with your program. So if, if it isn't familiar to you, um, it should be because it's almost the national anthem, right? Right, so, oh, now you can hear me. Um, so we, we will start by singing a song, Lift Every Voice and Sing. The lyrics are in your um, program. So I'm going to start it so we can sing along right here. Lift every voice and sing, till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. The faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new days begun. Test my song till victory is won. Thank you. So welcome to the Sable Lecture. I'm honored to welcome everyone this afternoon um, for the Sable Lecture 2023 with Afi Wortham. I'm Noreen O'Connor, and I have the honor of being the first person to speak to you. I'm a faculty member here at King's College. I teach in the English department, um, and I want to give you a warm welcome on behalf of King's College. Uh, uh, welcome into this space. I'm so glad that you're here. And, um, and also I want to thank King's College for, um, for honoring us by allowing us to have this and to host this event this year. Um, I especially wanna thank the IT staff members who have been working with me to help make this event streaming as well. And um, the conference and catering staff who have set up the room and have prepared a reception for us afterwards that we can enjoy. As a fellow student of San Francisco State University, I'm particularly thrilled to welcome Offie Wortham. I was just talking to him about that. I graduated from there with my master's in 1992 and he graduated, um, well, he went there in 1965, right? So wonderful. Um, I'm also a, a member of the Peace and Justice Center of Wilkes-Barre. I'm the steering committee coordinator. So. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to this event on behalf of the members of the Peace and Justice Center. The Peace and Justice Center is an interfaith organization, and um, we were created to educate groups and individuals in peaceful ways of resolving conflict, to nurture dialogue among diverse groups, and to partner in the ongoing struggle for human rights and a just world. This year's Barbara Sable lecture, I think hits every single one of the things that we work so hard for in our organization. It's one of the events that we sponsor every year to promote awareness of peace and social justice issues by bringing important thinkers to speak to the local community. The lecture is named after a founding member, Barbara Sable, of the Peace and Justice Center. We're especially happy this year to partner with the NAACP of Wilkes-Barre and the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Wyoming Valley. Both Bill Brown and Brian Dugas are members of our steering committee of the PJC as well. So their work um, it, with this event has my gratitude. One of the big organizers has been Bill Brown, who I'm going to invite to come up. He is now um, newly elected the president of the NAACP of Wilkes-Barre and he will explain a little bit more about the NAACP and welcome the next set of <laughs> speakers. Thank you. You all have to forgive me. I'm a little bit slow. Um, I'm, I've been the president of the NAACP for 
15 days now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, because I took office on January 1st. So I've been president for 15 days. My dad, it's my honor to have you all here. I am truly honored by your presence. Um, we wanted to hit the ground running. And so when I heard about um, Alfi, I instantly went to my collaboration mode and I spoke with Brian and we spoke with the um, Peace and Justice Center. And I'm a triple threat because I am a member of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation since 2009. And I'm a member of the Peace and Ju um, Justice Center as well. I'm on their steering committee. And that along with being the president of the NAACP, I'm sort of a triple threat. I kind of got um, right to the point and said, we really want to do this. So I'm 15 days in the office. I'm bringing a wonderful um, speaker along with other people that are helping me out. Um, I'd like to also make sure not to overlook inviting or um, noticing that we've gotten Congressman Matt Cartwright to attend like that. It's great having him here. And my good, my brother from another mother is uh, <laughs> Mr. George Brown, my mayor, the mayor of Wilkesbury. Like, I'm very honored to have you. Thank you for coming to this event and thank you for making this event popular. Okay. Um, the next person coming up is Brian Dugas. So uh, we're gonna have Congressman Cartwright is gonna come up and provide a few words. So please. Well, thank you, uh, Noreen. And, and uh, uh, great to see so many friends here this afternoon to, to help us come together and remember and celebrate Dr. King's history and legacy. I'm, I've been looking forward to hearing uh, Dr. Wortham's uh, uh, thoughts uh, on this occasion. Um, to have somebody actually here who walked with Dr. King and and knew so many of the important civil rights leaders so many years ago. It seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Uh, but I'm, I'm gonna tell you what, um, it's not so long ago. I, I was there in 2015 at the um, Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, in Selma, Alabama, at the invitation of my colleague, John Lewis, um, who, uh, who had his brains beat in at that site. And uh, um, it was uh, in one of the en enduring uh, treasures of my time in Congress that I got to serve with John Lewis. But I also want you to know, I served with uh, Elijah Cummings and uh, uh, Representative Cummings and I grew quite close because I, I sort of ended up as his Lieutenant on the oversight committee. But to have served with such people of such force of, of moral power. Uh, they were the, the ethical center of the Democratic caucus for their time there. And I'll never forget them. And I just wanted to come here. There was no way I was going to miss your speech, Dr. Wortham. So thank you for being here. And uh, uh, David, thank you for thinking of me. And uh, Mayor Brown, great to see you here as well. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Oh, Mayor Brown, the mayor would like to have, say a few words as well. Come along. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here today. Now, it's kind of difficult following Congressman Cartwright because he's a great guy. He's done so much for the area, for the city of Wilkes-Barre and in the state of Pennsylvania. So it's, it's an honor to be here with, with my friend Congressman Cartwright and everything he's done for us. Also, um, when I was asked to be here, I said I'd love to be here because I really do like to work with the NAACP leadership. My friend, uh, Bill Brown in the back, uh, I was happy to swear in Bill 15 days ago, as Bill said, <laughs> as the new president. And when Bill said, would you do this? I said, this is an honor. I mean, I get to marry people, but I also get to swear in people like friend Bill Brown. Uh, we have a very good relationship with the NAACP. So if you don't mind, let's say a few words about the NAACP and our partnership. Uh, we worked very closely in, in naming the park at the Toyota Complex, Dr. Martin Luther King Playground Park. Uh, that was something that we were working on for several years. And I was happy to, to see they came to fruition this past year. So if you go up to the Toyota Complex, you'll see a beautiful brand new large sign designating us in honor of Dr. King. 
Uh, we've worked with many different issues, the NAACP in the city of Wilkes-Barre. And one of my good friends, Dave Yonkai, is a big part of that also. And Dave makes sure that he keeps me informed of what's going on because we work in the same building at City Hall. Uh, but a couple of things about Dr. King that I did not know, I'm gonna share with you. Now, Dr. Wortham, I'm, I know you know these things, all right? But did you know that when the speech that was given in Washington, the I Have a Dream speech, they were expecting 100,000 people. 300,000 people turned out for that speech. The speech that he gave, I, gave, I Have a Dream speech, was not the speech that was supposed to be given that day. Did you know that? A lady named Mahalia Jackson heard him say that I have a dream speech and said, please give that speech today. These people want to hear that speech. And he did. And that was such a popular speech that it's copyrighted and owned by the King family, by the way. But Dr. King, you know, he, he preached nonviolence, yet he was murdered. His mother was murdered in church. A man that preached nonviolence died at the hands of violence. His mother died at the hand of violence. So we have to remember what he was teaching, what his vision was for the, the population of, of the United States working together, no matter what color you are. And we're going to continue to do that. So once again, thank you for letting me be here today. Um, I can't wait to hear Dr. Wortham's uh, speech because I spoke with him outside for about 10 minutes. And I know everything about him already. <laughs> Am I right? I mean... Someone said, did you meet Dr. Wood? I said, yeah, I met him 10 minutes. I already know his whole life. But anyway, it was, it was, a, it was a great conversation we had. And uh, I'm looking forward. So once again, thank you for letting me be here. I'm honored to be here. Bill, thank you. So good afternoon. My name is Brian Dugas. I'm a member of the Peace and Justice Center Steering Committee and president of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Wyoming Valley. Tonight, I have the distinct honor of introducing the speaker for the Barbara Sabol Lecture, Afi Wortham. It's a special honor to me because the more that I learn about Afi, the more impressed I am with his knowledge and life experiences. I met Afi on a trip to Italy last year. We traveled the country from top to bottom, and throughout the trip, I listened to his stories and knew right away that he was someone I had to get to know further. Since that time, I have listened to many more of these stories, and I am thankful that he has taken the time to come and share some of them with us this afternoon. I have to say that some of his thoughts have caught me by surprise, but I am starting to understand that just maybe he likes it that way. Offie was born into modest means and had many challenges to face as a young man, but his superior intellect provided him opportunities that many other men of his racial background did not have. His selection into a program with IBM after scoring 100 on their entrance exam is legendary and worth hearing about. As a rocket scientist working in the field, he tells stories about being under an electron microscope by his peers. But not only did he persevere, he, ex he excelled as the only person of color in IBM advanced research at that time. What is really intriguing to hear about is Offie's description of events surrounding his participation in the civil rights movement. During his years in college and beyond, Offie interacted with many civil rights leaders and other people who had leadership roles in the country. Among them were Malcolm X, Eleanor Roosevelt, and President Eisenhower. His service as a guide and chaperone for the Little Rock Nine and Daisy Bates and his selection to a delegation led by Harry Belafonte to represent the NAACP, NAACP youth on a visit to President Eisenhower are in his bio but just some of the stories he has to share. Off he left his position with IBM in order to, to focus his energy on the civil rights movement, where he significantly increased NAACP membership and participated in demonstrations and organizations across the country. Today, he and his girlfriend, Mickey, join us from their home in Vermont. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Afi Wortham rocket scientist, civil rights leader, and friend. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Brian for inviting me here. It was his idea, kind of crazy. And Bill Brown, and also uh, Dr. Margarita Rose for inviting me here to come here today. Thank you very much. Okay. When I told an old friend 
from 40 years ago, uh, Melania, Melanina Edwards, that I was speaking here today, she asked if I could start off my talk with the reading of a song written by her grandfather and her grandfather's brother, uh, Rosamond Johnson and James Weldon Johnson. James Weldon Johnson, who uh, wrote this music, uh, went on in 1920 to become the first executive director of the NAACP nationwide for 10 years. So I said to Melanie, yeah, okay, we'll do it. We did. <laughs> okay, I have seven grandchildren who do, not, who do not know the slightest, don't have the slightest idea of uh, the tremendous improvements that have been made in this country in terms of race relations uh, during my lifetime. The progress is mind boggling and incomprehensible. A black president, whoa. A black woman on the Supreme Court, wow. A black president of Harvard University. Mal uh, uh, Malcolm X <laughs> and many other people of color on a postage stamp. I mean, these people take this stuff for granted. This is I still can't get used to this. <laughs> First time I saw Malcolm on a postage stamp, I walked into a, a library. He was actually almost on the FBI most wanted list before that. He was considered by J. Edgar Hoover the, the most dangerous man in America. And to walk into a post, and I couldn't believe it. Whoa, but it's happened. I think it's great and possible. Okay, it's all been positive. Oh. Now, let me tell you some of the things I personally have gone through to help achieve the American dream, which I've always believed in. In 1938, I was born in Peekskill, New York, small town, 17,000 people. At that time, I was called colored, sometimes Negro, and then black, and now African-American or a person of color. I kept, what are they gonna call us next? Whatever. I really couldn't keep up with it. That's so serious. Who made that up? It was, a, but you got to be politically correct, you know. Uh, Peaks is a city of about 17,000, 40 miles north of New York, quite a suburban place. All the churches in that town were segregated by race, as most are still in the United States. There was no interracial dating. And I'm talking about now when I was in high school, 1955, 56, 55, 56. There was no interracial dating. <clears throat> Some pretty little white girls, I couldn't ask them out. No way. You know, we'd be friends, but no dating in Peekskill. No partying, no socializing. The first interracial party that I ever saw in Peekskill was one at my house when I became president of the NAACP. And I invited all the kids to come to my house. And they did. The first party in Peekskill, black and whites danced together. Incredible. Uh, so I saw that happen. Um, no interracial dating, marriages or anything. Um, there were three colored uh, bars and where you could pick up your barbecue and your fried chicken. There were two colored places to get your hair cut in somebody's basement. And there was one uh, shop for colored women to get their hair done. I never met in Peekskill, in high school, anyone who was Hispanic or Latino until a family from Puerto Rico moved to town when I was in high school. Never, knew, never saw a Hispanic, ever. There were only white teachers or administrators in our schools. No people of color, no teachers from K through 12 ever that I have in the school. No people of color in the city government. Like I said, colored bar, a colored a taxi cab. There were no millionaires 
or rap stars in the country or on any of the teams. College and basketball teams on TV, TV started to come in around uh, 65 or so. Uh, we didn't have one at first. We used to go to somebody else's house on the block to watch TV. To my first, that's it, what's that? <laughs> no TV, no commercials, none of that stuff, you know. So there were no uh, millionaires in the country of color, really, who were on the news. No role models. Okay? Uh, no black TV shows, no blacks on TV. Once in a while, maybe a Lena Horne might pop up or, or Nat King Cole might pop up or, you know, Harry Belafonte might pop up. But that was a big deal. For that, we'd have to run to our neighbor's house. What, they're gonna have a black person on TV? It was a big deal to see some big kind of those days. And it was against the law in the country, the United States, 15 states, for a white person and a black person to marry against the law until the Lovings case in 65. Uh, it was against the law in Georgia for a, um, a black person to sleep over at night in a white person's house. Because I went to Georgia during that time, during the civil rights movement. And as a protest, hundreds of us, black and white, slept on the lawn in sleeping bags in full defiance of the law in Georgia. Uh, police cars went, went by us with spotlights. We just said, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> that was when we were young and crazy, right? Okay. I became aware in Peekskill of the racial problems around the um, Little Rock, uh, 1954. You know, Little Rock kids couldn't get into the school. And before that, ooh, I didn't even, wasn't even aware that we had such serious racial problems in the United States, because we had none in Peekskill, right? They had a small NAACP, about 40 members. And we held regular uh, integrated talent shows well, white and black groups performed. Like I was in a group that was integrated. You know, your book, three whites and two blacks. We had a little group called the Originals. We had uniforms the whole bit. We performed in these talent shows, even sang in a couple of bars. Never made any money. Uh, but there was a big thing. That's the time of Frankie Lyman and the teenagers and all that stuff, uh, to have these talent shows. So we were putting them on. And so I became president of the NACP. And one night I said, okay, uh, two tables, a table to get in, $3 to get into the show. But it was also $3 to become a member of the NACP Youth Council. So I said, what about if we have two tables? The people have a choice when they come in. And of course we'll push them to the NACP table. For $3, you get in, but now you're a member of the NACP. We got 400 members in one night. Oh, the largest, if you go on Google right now, ever NACP Youth Council in the United States. 401 night. Calls from the national office. What did you do up there at Peekskill? I didn't tell them that we just switched tables. So. <laughs> Boy, I became a hero. That's how come I got uh, appointed to go with Belafani to the White House to see the president with three of the people from Little Rock and two of the students who did the first sit-in. So the eight of us went to confront Eisenhower while 15,000 people waited at the Lincoln Memorial. This was before the 63 March, but it was put on by the same people. You know, A. Philip Randolph uh, put this one on called the Youth March. And we got to the gate and uh, sitting in the car in a limousine and the man says, Oh, the president went out the back door. What? 15,000 people waiting, Harry Belafonte. What? Martin Luther King's on our committee. Everybody, Jackie Robinson, everybody. What? Yeah, he went to play golf at Camp David. Whoa, headlines in the papers all over the world. I have it in my scrapbook. Ike snubs youth. I saw Belafonte cry right there. We went back. 
right? All we were trying to do was get him to take a position on the 1954 Supreme Court decision, because after that, a lot of states, they were closing the schools, setting up all these separate white schools, you know. The president was completely quiet about how he really felt about school integration. So that's why we did that. Okay. So, that was fascinating. Now, I worked right after high school at IBM in Poughkeepsie. My father had had a stroke when I was 12. And uh, so we had no money. We were like what I considered uh, uh, upper lower class. I mean, my mother was a domestic for 50 years. You ever, you ever read the book or see the movie The Help? That's an autobiography about my mother. 50 years, as we say, she worked in the white folks' house. Which meant, of course, our house was immaculate. My mother used that white glove treatment. You know, put on a white glove. Go off, I'm gonna check your room. I'm serious. Dust, woo! That's what I was raised, yeah. You know, she said, if I'm gonna keep their houses clean, same thing here. Great, that was cool. My father was a factory worker, had a high school. My mother only went to the eighth grade. In fact, she had picked cotton before. But my father had a high school diploma, very proud of that, 1970, because in Peaksville for a black man to get a high school diploma was a big deal. And that's as far as he went with education and he was a factory worker, okay. So we had a nice home, quiet. And, uh, no, but no talk about college or anything like that. No, really, because we had no money and, and they weren't college people. So in my head, I didn't know what the heck I was gonna do, you know. Uh, so when my father died, I left home, well, no, before my father died, when I was still, when I finished high school, I got a job at IBM and it was more than a job, it was an apprenticeship program with IBM in computer electronics. And to me, this was, I didn't even know what a apprentice program was. And nobody knew in 1956 what a computer was, okay? There were no computers. The only thing was the computer was what you saw in Star Wars, fill up a whole room. There were no desktop computers for the next 10 years. So I was, trained at IBM for two and a half years to uh, maintain the, the ones that were uh, in the, fill up the whole room for the big companies and banks. They actually rented that service at $70,000 a month from IBM. A bank would send in all their stuff on punch cards and IBM would do it. Incredible compared to what you, right? And so when a company rented that computer, they wanted that computer up 24 hours a day. That meant three technicians. That computer would never go down. So I was trained to be on call 24 hours a day to keep those things up. And uh, I was the only person of color in the school. I didn't realize that until I got there, looked around the room. Never saw, it's crazy. Never saw another person of color. No women, of course, don't even think about women. And before that, I joined the Air National Guard to keep from going to Vietnam. And when I joined the Air National Guard, same thing. When I got to the Air National Guard base, oh, they said, because at that time, uh, the guards were never activated. The guard wasn't activated until Iraq or something like that. It was safe to join the guard. That's why, that's why Bush got into the National Guard to keep from going to Vietnam. Yeah? Guard was considered safe. So that's why I got in the guard, and I got in there. Um, but in the guard also, talk about experiences. I get to the guard, got my little uniform on, I always late, so I'm in the last row, shining my shoes, getting ready for the inspection. Thousand men, not one woman, but the shock was not one person of color. I said, this is crazy, you know. So I, I went through that for six years. No people of color in the guard. IBM, four and a half years. At, four, at IBM, 
I worked research all over the place. I never saw a technician or a scientist or an engineer who was a woman or a person of color at IBM. Yeah, that was an interesting experience, right? And I, I joke about it. I wasn't under a microscope. I was under an electronic microscope. Can you imagine what kind of a token I was and these people looking at me, how do you get here? What the affirmative action? I mean, you know, it was a kind of theoretically an uphill battle to prove every day that not only am I as good as you, but I'm probably better or else I wouldn't even be here. Whoa. And uh, it did come out to all of them that I was better because on the test at the guard, I always got a hundred. And it was crazy because the International Guard, we'd take these tests every six months and they posted them. Yeah, what the, I couldn't, I'd look at it because, you know, your promotion, everything depended upon these stupid tests. I couldn't even see the board. The guy would say, oh, don't worry, why don't you got the highest goddamn score in the base? <laughs> but luckily, luck, 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 I did well on these tests. And that alone, what could they do? You know, I did as well or better at, at work on the test. And I, I can honestly say in the guard at IBM, I never had any problems with racism or discrimination. Okay. I enjoyed IBM until I went to college and I enjoyed the guard until I got my honorable discharge. Okay, when I went to college at Antioch, uh, Antioch had 1,100 students. And um, did I mention or did this one that only eight of them were students of color? I didn't say that here yet, did I? Oh, Antioch in Ohio, when I took a leave of absence from IBM to go to college because the team I was working with at IBM were like eight men all PhDs, MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Yale, Oxford. But I was a peer. I did the drawings that appeared in the journals for the magazines. I'm the one who they came to and they said, Alfie, we want to make one of the first thin films, which was one of the first ships in the world. The room I was working in, which was my room, with my name on the door when I was 20 years old at the IBM Blue Sky Research Center, which is one of the top research. They would come to me and say, Arthur, oh, we want 100 chips made out of gold or platinum, 37 millionths of an inch thick. How long would it take you to make them? I built the vacuum chamber. I was using my boss's measuring device, which was his PhD at MIT, which was the most, mag most sensitive magnet in the world. You can take a piece of paper and draw a line on it, deposit a line of graphite from a pencil, people call it lead, and put it up there, one line, and you can measure the magnetic attraction between that line on a piece of paper and the center of the earth. <laughs> it blew my mind. That's how I got that job. Because I could have gotten a lot of jobs at IBM, but when I heard about that job, I said, I want to be, he had already fired four people. I said, I want to be his assistant. Said, you can't be a hitter. I want to meet this guy. It blew my mind. A line on a piece of paper in the center of the earth, the most magnet, most powerful. I just amazed my mind. So they took me up. I had turned down three other interviews before that. I turned down the interview to work with the guy who did the first desktop computer in the world. He interviewed me. It was interesting, but after I said, I said, do you have anything else? They said, what? You just I said, boy. Went up to see Boyd, names on the door, Dr. Boyd, 
Dr. Boyd, we have somebody out here you might want to talk to. We know you need an assistant. <laughs> Can we come in, Dr. Boyd? <laughs> Open the door. Now, I'm with the director of research, the whole IBM and my former boss that I graduated from the computer school with. We opened the door and Dr. Boyd is up on his giant erector set, which was his quote toy, which was his senior project at MIT for his PhD. Nobody in the world knew the heck what he was doing. He built this. He's up on this thing on a ladder. I'm in the doorway and I said, what are you doing? And the guys with me said, oh, this kid just lost it. Who the heck knows what, uh, what Boyd is doing? How can you even understand what the hell he's doing? I said, what are you doing? He looked at me like I was insane. There was maybe 30 seconds of silence. And he looked back at me and he said, it worked. <laughs> For the next year, with my name on the door. And I was in charge of that. And I was in charge of making the first ships in the world for IBM, okay? They would tell me how, how much of a million seven inch should it be gold or platinum. Okay, I could do that. Now what I'm saying, and I did that before I went to college. You know, I'm thinking after a while, these guys are getting paid four times as much as I am. They all got these degrees, big deal. They're not any smarter than I am, or else why would they be asking me to do all this crap, you know? So I got a leave from IBM. They gave me a leave of absence, and I could work back there whenever I wanted to. And I went to college to, to major in physics, because I was going to be a, a research scientist. Now, I wanted to go to MIT, but IBM did not have a relationship with MIT, only at that time for a master's or a PhD. So they said, well, you know, we'll pay for master's PhD, but okay. So I went to Indiana. So that was fun. Uh, and at India, India, back to that, 1,100 students of uh, four, eight students of color. Uh, Antioch was ranked number eight academically. Average SAT score is about 1,500. People didn't know it. Antioch was very, very elite college. Coretta and her sister, Scott King, graduated from Antioch. But anyway, so I'm in Antioch and uh, majoring in physics. And Dr. Stewart says, first physics class. Oh, we have a very interesting group here. Uh, everybody was a valedictorian, please raise your hand. There only 18 people in the class. Nine people raised their hand. Now, if you don't think that was intimidating, I mean, I've only seen, I wasn't valedictorian, but I only, nine people in the class. Half the class was a valedictorian. <clears throat> then he says, how many were salutatorians? Woo! Everybody else, except one person, a woman, the one woman in the class. Then he says, how many were national merit finalists? Even she and everybody raised their hand. Do you think they all looked over at me and said, what the hell is he doing here? It was incredible. And I just said to myself, I don't know what you think I said, but I said to myself, this is going to be fun. I said, these egotistical little assholes. <laughs> right? I mean, I had already graduated from uh, IBM school, which was the most advanced computer school in the world. I already had a lab making the first chips in the world. I was uh, in the Air National Guard. My job was a radar technician. I had three years doing the computers on jets from guns and navigation. And I'm sitting here with these damn kids. <laughs> okay. When the first test came back, Dr. Stewart said, oh, we have a very interesting test here. I'm going to hang it on the wall as a standard in how to do a lab test. A plus, Wortham, will you please stand up? 
I mean, yeah, that's what we had to do. Really? Okay. And if you don't think that that wiped them out, it did, you know, because what could they say? What could they do? You know, and I'm telling, I've always tell kids, so many kids, they can be so brilliant. You know, you have to be the best. You don't have to be as good. You have to be better. You have to be better. <laughs> and it works, let me tell you. So I, I tell the kids, my standards are very, very high when I work with kids, let me tell you. Okay, because I know they can do it. Because I've worked at a lot of programs after with students who were so-called, I at, at Andy, a few years later, I came back with the Rockefeller program and I was the ch chairman of the largest affirmative action program in the country for so-called underdeveloped kids. And I had over a hundred students at Antioch. Antioch just got a little crazy. <laughs> and they invited all these kids in who were not prepared academically. You know, I told you how what the academic standards were in Antioch. And everything hit the fan. And 10 years later, I'm called back to the school, be in charge of their program to help them clean it up. At that point, the Department of Education was ready to withdraw all federal funds from Antioch because the students who they brought in who were unqualified set up the first black dorm and the first black studies in the United States. Anybody check it out. You wonder where did black studies come from? Where did black? It came from Antioch because these students realized when I took over, 50% had not passed one course in a year. The kids, they were bright, but they realized they were being used. They withdrew, they demanded, they kicked the white kids out of a dorm completely, took over the dorm, they made money, they got paid, they taught themselves, they brought in black Panthers, nobody else to be teachers. And that was the first black, Antioch, being progressive and liberal, said, well, gee, isn't that interesting? Ah. They didn't know what to do. You know? Meanwhile, part of education says, we're withdrawing all federal funds because Dr. Kenneth Clark, who was on the board, um, Black, also head of the American Psychological Association, we withdrew with a full page letter in the New York Times. Imagine a full page letter in the New York Times saying why he's withdrawing. That got the attention of the government. And so they hit on Antioch because by that time, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and a lot of other colleges started allowing black dorms. And they said, no, 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 no. We're getting Antioch as an example. No black dorms, they're racist. So I'm hired. Hey, Offie, you want to go help Antioch? What the hell are you talking about? I went there, interesting job. And um, a lot of things happened. I got a grant from uh, Educational Testing Service at Princeton. Uh, I called in the top, well, actually a letter went out to the top 100 um, directors of programs for minority students in the country, looking for model programs how do, you, how do you find qualified minority students? How do you recruit them? Also that, how do you find qualified minority faculty? How do you keep them? Uh, so with this grant, I got a hundred programs, Harvard, Princeton, all over the place, telling what they were doing at that time to get more black faculty, to get more black students and to keep them. Uh, I and my secretary, I said, stay we went through that 100 and we picked out 44 from the money that I had. And I invited 44 and 44 came to a retreat I had at a Catholic monastery called Bergamo for five days. And they came because I paid all expenses, even from Alaska, the head of the Alaska program. He didn't know what he was doing in Alaska. Oh, uh, Chicanos all over. Berea College, which was a college for poor whites in Kentucky. He was like, why are you inviting the whites? I said, look, 
Poor whites to me are the same as poor blacks. I don't give a damn what color they are. They're disadvantaged students. So my conference was everybody together. And they came and they put together, this was the top people in the country. They put together, I said to them the last two days, hey, you're the best in the country. What would you do? What would be a model program? They chose the chairman, put it together. I watched, it was called the Bergamo Report. It went back to ETS, College Board Princeton, distributed nationwide. I used it at Antioch then to solve the problem at Antioch. And I said to the black students who were holding out, I said, look, if I can get you some money for um, all the supportive services you need and to increase the teaching of black history, which wasn't in the curriculum, if I get you money and you have your own little still, some black organization, will you close the door? Yeah, bro, we'll close the door. Because the guy had it with a communist. Huh? He wanted me to be I said, let me get that communist crap. I said, <laughs> they closed the black dorm. The board unanimously accepted my recommendations. And they didn't read it very closely. In the recommendations, you know how much my new plan cost? $250,000. They accepted it unanimously and ran off campus. The president was off at some conference. When he came back the next day, he fired immediately. The chancellor who had chaired that meeting, he said, how did you let that happen? Where are we gonna get $250,000? Ebony Magazine came in, front page, blacks closed the black dorm, boom, 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 boom. Pages and pages. Of course, my name was never mentioned anywhere. And uh, so then, I was called in front of the entire faculty. Where do you think he got the $250,000? He slashed the budget of every department 10%. He froze hiring for a year and cut off sabbaticals for a year. Now, can you imagine how popular I was on campus? Oh, I mean, you know, that's where he got the $250,000. Yeah. And then they had the nerve after that to make me head of the new program. Okay, so I started doing that. The Rockefeller program was getting ready to run out. All these students had been on full financial aid. I mean, they were guaranteed a full scholarship for four years if they just got minimum grades. They had promised them that. The students were promised that. But the grants was ending. The president was not picking up. Instead of doing fundraising, they started this network of colleges for Antioch all over the country. It was his big thing. He did not go after the money. He wasn't going after the money. And I quit. And I was writing my PhD at that time, using all that information I got from the, those 40 people to make the model program for my PhD. You talk about saving some time in research. I got my PhD and uh, I quit. I said, you know, and I predicted right in the period. I said, it is going to blow at Antioch. And I'm not going to be ahead of anything that explodes because you're not really going to, these students are going to take it when you don't give them the money. Within a year and a half, students took over the campus, closed every department, chained up every door. College was closed for two weeks. There were riots. And I could see that coming. And then eventually the whole college closed. But that's the kind of stupid thing that happens when people are greedy, like that president. Okay. A little story. Uh, how am I doing? It took me too long. <laughs> a barber, a barber in my hometown, not my, a barber at Antioch in Yellow Springs, white barber. At that time, black and white were separated. But we made a test case and I got the longest straw. So I had to go to the white barber. He refused to cut my hair. Oh, I, I had him arrested, all set up. The case went to the Supreme Court in Ohio. He lost. It became a case, a precedent nationwide, such that five years later, when I was in San Francisco, the white barber, you know, they were, I mean, it was segregated. Though. So I walked into 
a white barber, which was the closest place to where I lived in San Francisco. And this white barber said, oh, I can't cut your hair because I, I don't know how to cut black hair. I said, really? I said, well, I said, do you remember the, you ever hear of the Gagner case five years ago in Ohio? Yeah. I said, well, that was my hair. No problem with that barber. He became my barber. Yeah, that kind of thing. Stupid. Okay. Uh, another thing. Alex Haley, uh, you know, he wrote Roots and uh, Autobiography of Malcolm X. Well, I met him once at a dinner at somebody's house, and I actually took him back to the airport alone. And we communicated such that uh, I got a postcard from, uh, I got a handwritten letter from him from a motel where he was depressed. Ah! Telling me about his problems. Ah. So that's how I knew Malcolm L. But he had spoken and he got me so worked up um, that there was a, um, a movie theater in Springfield from Antioch that also said, We'll never admit black people. I hitchhiked up, didn't have a car then, went to the theater. No, uh, you got to be a member. Mm. Oh, really? How do you become? Can I join? No, you got to be recommended by a member. Really? Went to the police station around the corner. Yeah, Ohio, almost like being in a southern town. Almost like walking, as I say, through a bunch of good old boys to get to the police chief. They look at me like, what you doing here, boy? I said to the chief who I was. I was head of the group at Antioch. By that time, we had a large group. And I told them about the movie theater. And I, I don't know where I got this crap. I just said, we are coming back here. And we are going to integrate that movie theater. I mean, you know, crazy. I said, and we're going to come. And I said, and I don't want you here. A whole lot of police all over the place. I said, you can have some cops out there to protect us undercover. And you can have a van around the corner in case riots break out. Because uh, then the word got out that we were going to do this demonstration. And the movie theater owner got support from the Ku Klux Klan and, and the uh, Nazis nationwide. Oh, hit the press. By the time we got the demonstration together, oh, I had to go to the local black college, Central State in Wilberforce, because we didn't have enough black students in the demonstration. <laughs> I, I, I shamed them to get a busload of black students. I said, what the hell, we're gonna, we need some black students. Got them in there. Antioch's a hippie college, right? I talked to the kids, I said, look, you gotta wear shoes. You gotta wear socks, okay? You'll be the one that'll be in the press, you goddamn beatniks. <laughs> and we were a beatnik college a year before CBS had picked Antioch as the beatnik college, and they were a bunch of beatniks. I said, but you can't do that here. So the guy put on some shoes, a tie maybe with no shirt. <laughs> so we had 150 kids. Peacefully in line, round the block. The streets were lined like it was a Thanksgiving Day parade because of the publicity. People were anticipating watching a riot. I mean, the streets were packed. I was across the street <laughs> with two press releases, one very positive, thanking the theater owner for desegregating. The other press release was announcing the beginning of continual, continual demonstrations until he changed his policy. Two television cameras. My mother actually was watching it on TV live back in New York. It was nationwide at this point. David, who was a black student head of the line who picked the, got the straw, one of the eight black students. When he got to the ticket counter, the noise went silent, all the people. David walked up, turned around, 
held up the ticket, and the crowd cheered, okay? And all the students went into the theater. Rotten movie. <laughs> they told me, Orphe, it was the worst movie. You <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. They had to tolerate it. Anyway, after that, all over Southern Ohio, we, four or five of us could go because there were restaurants, bowling alleys, uh, um, skating, where no blacks were allowed. We just walked in very nice and said, hey, did you hear about what happened at the theater? Uh, okay, are we gonna have any problems here? No. We desegregated the whole Southern part. Not one resistance, not one problem, peaceful. I then had to go to the black churches and say, by the way, you can now go to that restaurant. You can now go to that movie theater. You can now go roller skating. I mean, because these people have been so beaten down over the years, they didn't even try. I said, you can do it. You got to do it. And if you have any problems, let us know. They thanked us for doing that. And there was never any problems. And that was good. A little adventure. So, did I tell one about Malcolm X when I was there? Oh, Malcolm X. I, I went to something called the Encampment for Citizenship on a scholarship from the NAACP. And Eleanor Roosevelt was the chairman of the board and uh, put on by the Ethical Culture Society in Manhattan. And the, the, the camp was at Fielson School in Riverdale. There were over 100 students from all over the world, handpicked uh, leaders, whatever that was. But it was fantastic. We had speakers there. Uh, Martin Luther King had spoke, Head of the United Nations had spoke. But, so they sent out an invitation to Malcolm X, who at that time was the most hated man in the country. Of course, he didn't respond to the invitation. Well, someone said, Arthur, why don't you go down and ask Malcolm? I said, well, I don't know Malcolm X. Come on, Arthur, you can do it. Yeah, right. So I went down, and a girl came with me who was from Israel, and she really wanted to see Malcolm, and she had worked very hard to get a can. And she was a Sabra, raised on a kibbutz. So we got to Malcolm's temple number seven, we were searched because Malcolm was under a death threat at that time. And they separated us and the women went to the right and I went to the left, about 700 people. I was in the first row, of course, Malcolm's stage was about 10 feet in front of me. So Malcolm got up and did his, one of his best speeches. He was an incredible speaker, of course. And his talk was how everything white was evil you know, everything black was good. And obviously, if everything white was evil, God made the white man out of sand. And you know what comes out of sand? You can't grow nothing in sand, not bad. The best stuff comes from black dirt. And that's where black people came from. And that was his logic and all sorts of things like that. And I'm in the front row looking at him completely bored. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. Such crap. I, that was my attitude. Mm -hmm. And he had the crowd, of course, jumping up and down, and raving about everything black was good and everything white was evil. And so when he finished his talk, I put up my hand and he pointed to me. I was kind of shocked. But he and I had made eye contact because he knew I just didn't respond. So he pointed to me. And I stood up. I'm a bit of a theatrical person myself. I'm in front of 700 of his loyal followers. And I stood up and I said, well, Mr. I started to say Little because his real name was Little. I said, I mean, Mr. X. I said, you really uh, have me confused. And I turned really toward the audience and I started shouting. I said, why, if everything white is evil, are you wiping your face at this moment with a white handkerchief. Oh, he looked at me like, and I said, and before, 
you make them laugh at me. Why are all the sisters in the first two rows, Muslim sisters, dressed from head to toe in white? I did my little thing. He looked at me like, oh, excuse me. And I said, like, like, give me your answer. He ignored me and went on to answer some friendly questions. And about five minutes later, he came back and pointed at me again. And he went like this. I, mean, I don't know what was going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I just embarrassed him in front of his entire delegation. Yeah, I walked up and he grabbed my hand. Boom! And when he grabbed my hand, the fruit of Islam, who protect him, to me, they all like, like Mike Tyson. They came at me like, and he just stopped because they were there to protect him. And he said, who are you? And I told him who I was there where I came from. And I said, I was just there to uh, find out if he was going to come and speak. And the girl passed in back of me and said, Alfie, I'll see you outside. Malcolm's still holding my hand. What nationality is that young lady? I said, when I got closer, I said, don't tell anybody. I said, but she's Jewish. I said, you got these rules here that are ridiculous. He actually cracked a smile. <laughs> I said, well, are you going to come or not? And he checked with, he's still holding my hand, checked with his appointment secretary. Next week, he says, I'll be there. He came himself with a carload of bodyguards. Uh, the girl and I met him at the car. I introduced him to the girl. <laughs> and we took him on a tour. And uh, the students by this time had been prepped by a professor from Columbia for a confrontation with Malcolm. I mean, he could bring white people to tears. I mean, he, he was so strong and powerful. And so the kids had to be prepared for this kind of attack. And they were prepared by this professor. Not only were they prepared and ready for the attack, they had specific questions because Malcolm was also the minister of information for the nation of Islam. And they had just demanded from the United States three states be given to the nation of Islam, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming or something, Nebraska, whatever it was, three landlocked states they were demanding the United States give them. So the students were prepared. So Malcolm and I, with questions, we're on the stage, just two of us, and the students start off. Well, Mr. Malcolm, you're asking for three landlocked states. Uh, we assume you're going to have your own airline. You're not going to use the white man's planes, are you? Oh, that has not been revealed to me yet by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Oh, you're not going to use the white man's money, are you? You're going to print your own money, aren't you? On and on. You're going to have your own automobiles. You're going to have your own this. How are you going to have a nation that is landlocked? He could not answer one question in over half an hour. Every single time he said, this has not been revealed to me yet by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. After it was over, he and I alone had uh, dinner in the place. And he admitted to me that he had never been confronted like that, where he could not, he, he, said, it, he said it stopped him cold. And I said, well, better get it together. <laughs> You're the Minister of Information. And, and uh, we had a nice talk about a lot of things. And I told him, I said, yeah, you are the greatest speaker, you know, out here besides Martin Luther King. Bro. And I said, and I told him right to his face, I said, if, you ever stop becoming a racist, I would follow him. And I told him, right face. A few years later, he went to Mecca, came back, and he was not a racist. He changed the policy. The new organization he made up was interracial, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, that's when they killed him. Okay. So, uh, I have a lot of stuff here to keep on track. One of my things with uh, demonstrations was when I was 
we were demonstrating and protesting and confronted with whites, of course, sometimes with baseball bats, chains and clubs coming at us. And I would say right out, I am not nonviolent like John Lewis. No way. I said, you might beat me. I said, but like Malcolm says, you will have been in the worst fight in your life. And that was my attitude. It stopped them cold. He just looked at me. And you might beat me. I said, but you are going to have the worst fight of your life. That was it. I wasn't going to let, you know what they did to, us, to John and then beat him like that? No way can I let anybody beat all over me. So I was never hit, never, no violence, ever. Okay. Okay. One thing about uh, Stokely Carmichael. Well, Stokely, by the way, I told him uh, in Berkeley one time when he was at a SNCC, I said, Stokely, did you, he went to Howard University. I said, Stokely, you didn't know it, but your best friend at Howard and your photographer, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, he was an undercover, undercover FBI agent. A graduate of, he was one of the first black graduates of the University of Texas Law School. And uh, so therefore, Stokely was being, you know, the whole time. I was asked twice to infiltrate. I didn't. But when I did go to the black meeting that I was asked to infiltrate, I told the students that the meeting was being infiltrated. Okay. Ooh. Okay, a little bit about Malcolm and uh, King. They were really, in a lot of ways, much closer than most people ever know, knew, okay? Uh, and also the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, I'm saying there are major differences in the civil rights movement in the Black Lives Matter movement. Some historians now believe that the primary goal of Black Lives Matter is, is the same as that with the civil rights movement and it's built on the same shoulders of, um, you know, people. But, but Black Lives Matter, they don't depend on one single big leader. They have a diversified thing all over the country. And now with the help of social media, they can respond to things very, very quickly. So I had a little problem with Black Lives Matter when it first started out, I couldn't understand. But now I understand, and um, it's a very positive movement, as long as they're nonviolent, okay. Uh, as far as Malcolm and King were concerned, uh, Malcolm considered the 1960 63 march on Washington, he called it the farce on Washington. Malcolm wanted Dr. King to paralyze the city, not be all in harmony with it. So they disagreed on that. Uh, they only met personally twice. And that was in 1964 in Washington, sort of secretly to push for the Civil Rights Act, okay? When uh, Malcolm died, uh, Martin wrote a very, very personal letter to, uh, uh, Malcolm's wife, Malcolm's um, you know, wife, saying how much he liked Malcolm, how much they were really together, and he was sorry that he got killed. People like James Baldwin wrote, you know, they were getting, uh, he said there was practically any difference philosophically between Malcolm and Martin when they both got killed. They were both against the Vietnam War. They had both recognized that the greatest danger is Okay, they were focusing in on the economic problems in this country, the root causes of it, which was a great threat to the people who run this country. Okay, and you check it out with some little research as to who was really behind the assassinations of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and John F. Kennedy. Comes to be about pretty small group 
people, military industrial complex. Not much. Many, lots of proof on this right now, okay? But Malcolm, he, he, Malcolm, as he got closer uh, to, to uh, Malcolm and King got closer, the FBI became worried that they were going to get together. And they didn't want Malcolm and, and uh, Martin Luther King getting together. Ah. So they were both, hate to say it, the FBI was very happy when they were both gone. All right, I can have say some more things about some of this stuff, but uh, I'm getting the note that I'm, my time is limited. So I'm going to end here and say, um, I'd like to get together with you, talk about anything. I have a lot of stuff to talk about, but I'm kind of limited here. And it was great talking to you. <laughs> Any questions about anything? Any questions? Okay. Trying to sum up 30, 60 years of talking about Oh, oh. Sorry. Do we have a, thank you so much. And uh, Bill, uh, why don't you come up here? Bill would like to, um, Back to you. Yeah. Okay. First, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I need a show of hands of people who will be attending the reception um, at Shogun like that later on after this. I just need a show of hands so that I can give a count up like that. Come on, put your hands up high. Let me see them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And anybody else? Okay, so, so we'll say nine. Huh? Yeah. Plus two, nine, 10, 11, okay. Um, now back to what why we're just doing here, here we are. Oh, oh Bree, if I can have you up here for a second. Because I'm a triple threat, uh, and I've already explained what that is. Yes. Um, we have this plaque that we've had. Wow. Now, and this is a life achievement award. Holy like man. Like that. I've and never then, had one of these before. Well, you've got one now, and wow. you, you really, really deserve this is one. great. Like that. So we want to present you. you with this. This is a box that came in like that. And we just, we appreciate you so much. I just met you today, and I want to be like you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the truth. I just met you today. I want to be like. Right. There's one little okay. story I didn't tell. What else am I supposed to do? Can I tell one little story quickly? One quick so, story. What he wants one quick story. It's about Coretta. Martin Luther King's wife. When she was opening the center in Atlanta, I worked with her a bit on that. And she asked me before she was opening the center, it took her 13 years to get the money to open the center. And she says, Dr. Willem, so I called her Mrs. King, Dr. Willem, I would like you to open up the first workshop at the center and give an address. Where would Martin be leading the movement if he were today? I was Florida. She could have asked Josh Jesse Jackson. She could have asked Andrew. She could have asked. Anybody in the world to give a speech like that? Where would Martin Luther King be leading the movement if he were alive? <laughs> I was floored. Did a lot of research, thought about it, did it. After it was over, after it was over, I'm getting it. In the first row, Mrs. King and the four kids looking at me. I'm telling them what Martin Luther King III came up to me right after. He's about 17 and asked me to help him form the youth movement for the program. So they liked the speech and she used it after. But that was one of the greatest, I put it with this, <laughs> honors I've ever had of anybody. Well, thinking. we definitely appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Was there so I would just wow. like to say,
that we've heard a lot of stories today, but if you think that is all of the stories, you are really mistaken. <laughs> the way to speak to Afi is personally one-to-one. -one. We're having a reception out here where you can speak to him, ask him questions. He will tell you things that you can't believe. Thank but we're you. also, that's the reason behind the, the get together at the Shogun restaurant as well. So they can get to meet the man personally and hear some more stories. So thank you very much for coming. We appreciate everybody being here and have a nice day.